Okay, yeah, as Miriam so kindly said, I'm Kate Compton. Um, I am an assistant professor of instruction, which means I just do teaching. I don't do research, except that at this point, my research is very much teaching. Um, so my motto has for the last couple of years be, been um, bringing AI to the people that AI doesn't deserve. Um, so I've been working on what I'm calling the takeout model of AI. So often when we talk about, uh, we, we have to bring everybody into STEM, we have to bring everybody into coding, um, <clears throat> which was very important for a number of years. Um, there was a book called Unlocking the Clubhouse in America of like why women and um, yeah, specifically women, but it kind of extended to a lot of different people, why they drop out of computer science. Um, and the idea of the thesis of that book was, it was written in 2004 about a study done in 2000, was that we need to get everybody into the clubhouse. Um, and my latest model is uh, what if we have takeout fields um, where the fields, you don't have to actually come into AI to get useful AI information. You can actually come to AI, get a packet of takeout and take that back to your field of practice, whatever it is. Um, so the latest thing I did on that, uh, which I'm very proud of was I taught an all day AI workshop to the theater department, um, to non-coders in the theater department. And they were able to pick stuff up and start making creative coding experiments. Um, so that's kind of my, my philosophy of like, how am I gonna bring AI techniques to people who might be able to use them. Um, so that's not entirely what I'm talking about today, but I just wanted to kind of like frame up my work in that way. Um, so as Miriam said, um, I'm Kate Compton. I worked on a lot of stuff. Uh, that's Galaxy Kate. It's just got way too much stuff on it, um, but you can kind of browse around on it. Um, I'm also working on artbot.club. So if you want to try out Tracery, which was mentioned, uh, you can go to artbot.club. Um, and then as part of this like kind of mission to bring AI to people, um, I do a ton of outreach stuff. So I do these workshops, but I also make a lot of zines. And so, um, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I'll be talking about casual creativity today. Um, and then I do have a casual creator zine as part of my zine packet that's available on my site or on HIO. Um, so yeah, kind of a little bit about the like history of my research. So my research has taken kind of a number of directions over, over the many years I've been doing it. Um, in 2003-ish, when I started kind of in this field in undergrad, um, I was really interested in like, okay, well, I'm, I'm learning to program. It's really exciting to like make a hundred circles on the screen. Um, and just the sort of magical moment for me was writing a for loop that made circles on a screen. And I just sat in the back of the computer lab cackling because for me, the magic of computer science was like, what if the computer can do things that like just keeps going and is just kind of like, um, blossoming out uh, what Michael Cook often calls making things that make things. Um, and I know you had Michael uh, on earlier. Um, so this kind of idea of procedural content generation as a, a, a garden that grows and blossoms for you. Um, I felt just even at the beginning before anybody knew the term procedural content generation, um, it really caught in it, like my eye. Um, and then I was also at the same time writing a dissertation on like, um, what it means to simulate things like gender or history or economics um, and what things do we put in and what things do we leave out um, and that any particular simulation you know if you're simulating the sims it's like oh people are a bag of needs that are going up and down um, isn't that an interesting way to simulate people like what isn't that simulating about folks <coughs> um, and then yeah from there i kind of did some more graduate research on procedural content generation and i went to work for spore um, and then I started getting really into on Spore, not only is it the computer generating these things, but it's generating things in conversation with a human. It's this ki kind of idea of like mixed, often it's called mixed initiative creativity, um, mixed initiative generation. The idea that humans and computers, the computer sometimes is a tool, sometimes it's a partner, sometimes you're taking turns, sometimes you're kind of working in a like simultaneous dance, um, but you're working together to make things like with this partner um, is this kind of idea of partner creativity I found really interesting. And I started like noticing that more exciting things happen when you had a human in the loop than if you just had a big red button that said, please make me an art. Um, if you ever see a, an AI that is just like a big red button that says, please make me some art, like that's kind of a standard model that used to exist in computational creativity. And it's, I, I think it's just not actually that productive. Um, so yeah. And then that took me through my dissertation where I was writing about casual creators, which we'll talk about like during this talk. Um, and then kind of at the very end of casual creators, it, it took me a really long time, about nine years to write that dissertation. Um, not because it was actually particularly hard to write, but because there was always just new stuff. And at the very end, like the last few chapters that I started putting in were about like, gosh, it's really neat when 
humans and computers are working together. So you have a creator and an AI that are working together. Um, but actually often that's kind of the core of this whole creative ecosystem. And it's the ecosystem that's actually causing people to be creative. Um, let me see if I can, can I bring up the chat window. Uh, well, Miriam, shout if there's anything in chat. Um, but yeah, like, you know, put in chat, uh, if you would, if you are doing any like group creative stuff outside, like, are you responding to art prompts somewhere? Do you do, um, are you part of like the AO3 fanfic community? You don't have to out yourself if you are, but like, you know, it's, I think it's just really interesting that a lot of us are creative in these kind of networks of creativity. Like, are you on Ravelry when you do knitting? Um, so there's these like big, like we're often creative in communities, certainly in the university system, we're creative. Um, but then like, just on our social networks, there'll be like drawing prompts on Twitter for, um, I did mermaid this year, which is like you paint mermaids for the month of May. Um, and it's super fun. Um, I sent Miriam a drawing prompt uh, last week. Um, but yeah, so like my latest research is just, gosh, when people make things, um, and also when people make things with computers, they end up being part of this ecosystem that's super fascinating. So that's gonna be, and they socialize with each other. Whenever you have, basically if you have two people that are able to communicate in any way on the internet, that becomes a social network. Um, and as soon as two people communicate in any way, you get a social network and there's this whole bag of human affordances that start to like, people want to present themselves to each other. People want to like have rituals together. Uh, and we'll talk about that today. Um, I'm also not looking at time. So uh, feel free to cut me off whenever I start like really going on. Um, so yeah, there's a couple of books that you can check out, but like one of my favorites is uh, David Gottwitz. He, he keeps coming out with new editions as like things change online, um, but he actually goes a lot into the history of crafting. So like what crafting meant as a social environment in the, the 1890s when the Victorians were inventing the concept of leisure time versus the 1920s where the Boy Scouts were getting really into, the Boy Scouts of America and a lot of like sort of uh, probably in Sweden as well, there was this whole, um, we're worried about young people becoming too modern too fast. So if we make them do a lot of crafting, that's like kind of an old fashioned activity that's safe and not jazz related. Um, so there's a lot of kind of crafting as like social intervention in these spaces. Um, but I also wanted to, I was kind of thinking this is like a, a talk that's stuffed with too many things. And like, I'm gonna go through some of it really fast because I don't wanna go through all of my slides, but I was kind of thinking of like, like what really ties it all together. Um, and Emily Post is this uh, writer in America who's, um, I don't re remember when the original one was writing, probably in the 1800s, or early 1900s, um, but she was writing about uh, etiquette and like, what is it to like properly throw a dinner party? Party? How do you like properly respond to a wedding invitation? Like what gift do you give people for certain anniversaries? Um, and there, there have been numerous Emily posts since then that like write in her column. So her column is still going. And somebody wrote to one of them and said, um, I don't know whether this is a direct question, but she, she ended up on the topic of like, well, what is this all about? What is etiquette all about? Like, why are we doing these weird rituals? Like, why do I need to respond to a wedding invitation in all these lines? And she said, okay, look, the thing is about, the thing about etiquette is it's about comfort. What you're trying to do is make a space where people know what's expected um, and what their range of kind of acceptable behavior is. So then you feel comfortable. Um, it's not, you're trying to exert control over them. If you're, if you're exerting control over people, it's kind of no longer etiquette. What you're trying to do is make a space where they feel like they know what's expected of them. So then paradoxically, they can be themselves. Uh, and I think this is actually what's going on with casual creators, which is a category of software about creativity is like, it's about being a very polite piece of software that tells people, hey, you're welcome here. I want you to like, feel at ease. And so paradoxically, I'm going to tell you a couple of things that you probably ought to do um, so that you don't have to kind of come up with that on your own. I'm going to be a good host and provide affordances so that you don't have to like construct your own chair when you come in. Um, you know, I don't say, would you like any beverage at all? Like think of any beverage in the world that you would like, but I was like, would you like a cup of tea? And then all you have to say is yes, no. So it's kind of providing offers to people um, to be a good host. So kind of think about like, what would your software be as a polite host? Um, so casual creators, I'm just going to tell you kind of briefly about this, this definition of thing. Miriam, has, has your class encountered casual creators before? I don't think so. Uh, okay. Have you? If you have, uh, you can uh, like, like do a little wave or something in the yeah. chat, but uh, I mean, we are all ears. Please go ahead. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this is kind of coming out of the idea of like, who is creative? So casual creators is computers, 
or like systems that are not necessarily computer systems, but they help us be creative. Um, and that's the idea is like programs that enable creativity. Um, and the first thing that I say when people or like the first thing that people often say to me when I'm doing this is like, oh, you want like famous people to be creative. So what is creativity? Here are a couple of people who are creative, sort of famous painters, famous artists, famous, famous thinkers throughout history. Frida Kahlo is creative. Um, George O'Keefe is creative, that sort of thing. Um, and actually, no, uh, it's really interesting. We, we do think that creativity, as far as we can tell, is like a universal human trait. Um, the most uncreative people that you know have the capability of being creative, um, especially when they're children. Um, and so creativity is an everyday kind of human process. Um, uh, birds sing, worms make dirt, humans are creative. This is just a thing that if you put a human in a space, they will start doing. Uh, we also, it's really interesting, we know a lot of stuff about creativity. So creativity research is a whole field, uh, or rather it's a thread across multiple fields of sociology and psychology and all sorts of different things, um, even like cognitive science and neuroscience. Um, one other thing is it tends to happen in communities. So this is a super weird paper that I love. Um, uh, and it's it, somebody doing data science on the history of the impressionists. And uh, this is all, uh, the chart on the right is super small, but it's actually all of the famous uh, people of the Impressionist and Expressionist movement um, and um, when their peak productivity was, was. And you can notice that they're actually kind of clustered. Like, um, and this is not only clustering um, in time, but it's clustering spatially. So a lot of these people were actually like in very small neighborhoods and often in the same buildings in Paris. Um, if you wanna look up some like super wild history, um, dang, I'm gonna blank out everybody's name. Uh, but uh, the guy who wrote Cannery Row, um, famous American author who I'm, whose name I'm blanking on, um, the guy who did the like uh, sort of arcing of narrative, what is it, the, the man of 10,000 faces, um, the sort of like early, like let's construct, uh, like what is, what is a story kind of stuff. Um, and this ecologist who studied tide pools were all living together in two houses in Monterey for about 10 years uh, and having drama together and going on long walks where they talked about systems. And then they all ended up making these like works about systems in these three different fields that like spawn entire fields. So this kind of idea of creativity happening in a very small space of people bouncing ideas off of each other rapidly. And even when we think about people like Van Gogh, often when you're like, oh, lone creative genius, um, Van Gogh, like he does like his most productive work in the countryside in Paris in um, a sort of like, not sanitarium, but like um, outpatient rehab center. Uh, but he is constantly every day mailing paintings back and forth to Paris. And so as far as you can in like 1880, he is extremely online. Um, so he's constantly in conversation, even as a kind of like reclusive guy. So this idea of like, no, you actually need a community to be creative. Um, so yeah, it also, um, this is like, it, lots of stuff about creativity studies. Um, this is often codified as you need an individual, a domain, and a field. So you need the person doing the creativity. Um, you need the field as everybody else kind of watching you. So like your audience, your curators, your peers, um, and then you need a domain, like the thing that you're actually being creative about. You know, are you being creative in like um, gothic sci-fi stories, or are you being creative in um, really interesting tea preparations? Are you being creative in oil paintings? And that kind of like defines the space of your creativity. So yeah, um, and then the other really interesting thing is it like doesn't just happen in the mind. Um, so this idea of embodied cognition um, and embodied creativity of uh, when people start being creative, like you start sculpting something, you'll often talk about your hands kind of being creative in the piece. Um, and then the piece like kind of pushing back on you. So everybody who is, who's written a short story knows the feeling of when your characters don't wanna do the thing that you have scheduled for them. Uh, and they start pushing back and say like, no, this is not who my character is. Um, or your piece starting to like push back on you and say like, no, this is actually like you draw a line and suddenly your painting is a different painting than you thought it was going to be. So this idea that like, we don't simply form our grand idea in our head and then it's down to our hands to like kind of carefully render it out line by line. It's actually a conversation of the whole body and the work itself. Um, yes, that's kind of like, where is creativity? Like it's out in our friends, it's down in our hands. It's definitely in our minds as well. Um, and then kind of like, what do we mean when we talk about creativity? So these are um, my terminology for four, like people break this down into different ways, um, but these are kind of like the general categories that they seem to be pointing to. So you have things like 
uh, virtuosic creativity, which we've mentioned before, like the Georgia O'Keeffe, the grand creatives. Uh, you have professional creatives. So if you're like, if you have a politician that's like Stockholm needs more creative industries, um, often they don't mean that we're like manufacturing Georgia O'Keeffe's. Um, they mean that like, okay, well, we want like a Pixar, or we want like um, fashion houses. So these people who often like picks, like if you work in Pixar, you're not doing stupid, like super creative stuff all the time. Um, often you're like working to spec on a creative project. Um, so that's a very different experience than like, here's a blank canvas, just have a go. Um, and then you have things like situational creativity, which is uh, if you ever take a, if you ever want to study creativity in a psycho, like a psychology thing, like you're like, I think that eating breakfast will make middle schoolers more creative. Um, and you want to like evaluate that. Um, you give half of them breakfast and half of them not. And then you say, okay, here's a test of creativity. Um, how many uses can you think of for a paperclip? This is kind of the like standard metric of creativity in psychology is the paperclip test. And you just have people write down like, okay, to hold two pieces of paper together, uh, fishing hook, earring, um, thing to make a, a zipper pull. Um, and just like the more things that you can list, the, the more creative you are. So this is like measuring situational creativity, but it's, it's assumed to be a metric of like, oh, and also this should cause professional or virtuosic creativity. Um, the bit that I'm kind of interested in is expressive creativity. Um, so this is just like you're making some stuff uh, for, like as this kind of human expression. Um, creativity like in the field is sometimes defined as it's something that is novel and useful. Um, and you can see that that kind of works for maybe situational or virtuosic creativity, but it's not actually that like clear that it works for expressive creativity. Like if somebody gets all the, when, when we study like um, creativity helps people like form bonds with new social groups. It helps them recover from surgery. It helps reduce recidivism in um, prisons. Um, all that stuff doesn't seem to be like linked to whether or not the thing that they're making is useful or novel. It, it tends to be more of this expressive creativity. Like it's okay if you've made the scarf that everybody else has made. It's okay if you like do the weird TikTok creativity thing that everybody else is doing and that it's neither new nor useful in any way. Like it's, you still get all the benefits of creativity. So yeah, that's the one that I'm kind of focusing on in the rest of this talk. Um, so yeah, we like, especially when we're talking about that one, we know what prevents creativity um, more than like what causes it. Because again, we think that like what causes it is actually just a thing that occurs. Um, so these are a couple of the things that like, it's very clear that these will stop you from being creative. Um, so being undirected, being trained to come up with the right answer, um, being afraid of negative judgment, running out of ideas. Uh, these are all things that kind of suppress your creativity. Um, you know, the, the risk of judgment can also be like in the, uh, in the educational space, it's really hard to get people to be educate, like to be creative in education, if they feel the threat of a grade. And so it's like very hard for educators to thread the needle of like, you know, I want you to be able to make anything you want for your software final project. But I also know that you're not going to be super creative, because what if it fails, and I have to give you an F. And so we have to like very clearly communicate like where you're like, as good hosts ourselves of a class, we have to communicate you know, what is the expected behavior for, for you to do? And then how much room do you have to like be creative outside of that? Um, it is really cool though, that like once we have these things that are our problems, we can use AI to basically attack each one of them. And the Spark Creature Creator did a really phenomenal job of this, um, which is why we use it so often. So that was kind of at the core of this idea of uh, casual creators of like, okay, some of the software on this screen is for like virtuosic creativity or professional creativity where you have like um, a very specific need or a very specific vision and you have to be able to control it fully. Um, and then a couple of the things on the screen are things for like, if you don't have a great vision, um, if you have a, a tool, like if you have a user who's using this for um, an autotelic purpose, which is for its own purpose, um, maybe they just wanna say like, I want to spend 20 minutes doing a creative thing. Um, I don't particularly care what creative thing I'm doing, and I certainly don't care about the output, but I want the experience of being creative. As you can see, the ones on the right, like, like look at what this UI is. Apparently, like, dark gray is the color of professional creativity, um, but also just, like, look at all those buttons. Look at all the controls. Um, this is, like, software that is going to give you total control. And then the ones over here, these are casual creators. Notice that they have, like, a lot fewer buttons. Like, this one just has um, almost no buttons. You just like select the color and then you start scribbling. Um, this one uh, doesn't in fact have any buttons at all. It's called Cornify. Um, you can upload your photo and then just like, I think the mash the enter key um, and it will like spam unicorn gifts onto your photo until you're satisfied. 
So like one button creators is kind of a thing that you can do with casual creativity. You can't have a one button unity. That would be great. Like just the like mash the like make my game button. Um, but that's not how unity works. Um, so yeah, this kind of idea of like, these are two very different categories of software and the design patterns for both are like totally different. Um, so one, you get total control, one, you get flexibility and surprise. So yeah, these are, this is just my definition of casual creators. Um, once I had this term, I could apply it to all these like super disparate pieces of software. So the one on the bottom is KidPix, which is a famous casual creator from the eighties and nineties, um, that was like MS paint for children. Um, but the guy, uh, if you want a really great reading for casual creators, um, the guy who made uh, Kid Picks, I'll send this to Miriam and she, she can send it out. But the guy who made Kid Picks made a really beautiful retrospective of what he was trying to do with Kid Picks. And it was all about um, when he first learned to use a computer, it was all about like pressing the button and just being surprised by what happened when he was learning what a computer was. And he wanted that experience for, ch for children. And so it's a lot of like, yeah, you can click this brush and start painting, but the brush is going to surprise you in some wonderful way. Uh, and it's not going to be controllable. You don't use kid picks to draw portraits. You use kid picks to kind of be surprised and delighted um, uh, at this partner. Um, and then this one at the top is called Edges to Cats. It is an AI tool um, built with a pix to pix technology. And what it is, is you draw a line um, and then the machine learning algorithm will attempt to twiddle that, like the pixels of that line until it optimizes for the amount of cat in that drawing. Um, so you can totally attempt to actually draw a cat, um, but a lot of people have often like, you can be very playful with this partner. So you can draw a loaf of bread and it'll turn the loaf of bread into a cat or a slice of pizza or Batman. And it'll attempt to like make those things into a cat or like just draw a circle and like, what does an orb cat look like? Um, so it's kind of fun to like push at these things. Like it's often fun to make these things dreadful or like attempt to get your partner to make you something dreadful uh, because you don't really care about the outcome. You're just trying, you're just there for the experience. Like if I want to play with unity to make something dreadful, it's almost too easy and I don't want to do it. Uh, but if I have a tool that's like trying to help me, it's kind of fun to push it and like make it make it terrible. But yeah, all these are kind of like working really hard to remove the barriers to creativity. Um, so yeah, there's um, I've got some pink boxes in this talk and actually, oh, I do have a phone that will tell me the time so I can be better about like um, not taking up the entire hour. So yeah, this is casual creators. If you take one thing away from this talk, take the term autotelic and the term casual creators. Um, you can make software that like helps people be creative. So yeah, um, I'll just go super quickly through the, my slides because I do want to get to the social stuff just because like social stuff is really interesting to us right now. Um, but yeah, tons of casual creators in this world, um, you know, in conversation, in sound, in art, also like in literature, you, you, you like have some that will help you write in interesting ways. Um, and yeah, they're all just kind of about being a good host. So, like. Um, you don't want a blank slate when you're using a casual creator because that's like one of the biggest problems in creativity is this idea of like a blank slate. Um, and so you might have a blank notebook, which is hard for you to be creative in um, unless you are kind of driven and have your own idea. But you do have in casual creators all these like drawing challenges. Um, you know, what's hatching out of these eggs? Um, you know, feeling like Father's Day card. Like you may love your dad, um, but given a blank page in which to describe how you love your dad, a lot of people will freeze up. Um, and so, yeah, casual creators, if you'd like to read more about them, um, I have zines, I have my giant dissertation, um, but the zine I would suggest starting with. Um, so yeah, social casual creators, I just want to go kind of at least quickly into this to kind of plant this in your head. So, okay, so casual creators, you're being a good software host by providing your user kind of activities and affordances, an outstretched hand that says, would you like a cup of tea? Would you like a drawing prompt? shall we draw a mouse together? Um, you know, make it a little bit interesting, make it, make it, make them feel that they, they're not going to fail at this. And sometimes, sometimes even being a good host is making them feel that they're going to fail, but we're all going to fail together. Um, so if you've used things like uh, a lot of the Jackbox games, um, uh, or if you've done Pictionary in the past where it's like, okay, draw, it's not draw an easy thing. If we all draw a circle together, okay, we're all drawing circles together, but it'll be like, um, draw the, ex like, uh, draw a ridiculous thing, like draw um, uh, the experience of forgetfulness um, or draw the squiggliest thing you ever saw. So kind of these like ridiculous prompts or draw with your eyes closed. So that we all know that we're going to fail together. And paradoxically, that kind of makes it's 
often social level leveling is part of being a good host. It's not like everybody tell me your incomes and I'll decide which chair you get in my house would be being a very bad host. Uh, but like, no, we're all getting the same chair. We're all getting the same dessert. Um, no matter if you're like the king of Prussia or like my impoverished cousin, we're all going to sit in the same place and I'm going to pretend that we're all for a day level. Uh, and so often you have these kind of leveling techniques as part of being a good host in your software. So yeah, social casual creators, we're all really lonely online during the pandemic. I know Sweden had like different forms of lockdown than America did, but we definitely like, we've all spent a lot of time alone on the past year um, or even not being able to travel or like having conferences is kind of a, a thing. Um, by the way, if you all haven't gone to conferences um, in the pandemic, this is a really great time to go to weird conferences that you might have not considered because you didn't like suddenly you don't have to justify a $500 ticket and then like a giant plane flight. Um, so go to like the roguelike celebration, go to strange loop, um, go to all sorts of like weird conferences that you might find online and just like pay your $20 fee and see if you have new communities you didn't expect. Um, it's like, there's a weird opportunity to be very experimental with who you're talking to online now. Um, so make some lemonade out of the pandemic. Um, so yeah, like this is just me thinking about like, okay, like how do you throw better Zoom parties? Um, so casual creators give us permission to be creative um, as a good host. Um, and then so do like, so this is a uh, drawful. This is like what I was mentioning with the Jackbox games. Um, they kind of set you up to fail in amusing ways. So we're all gonna fail, we're all gonna be leveled, but like we're all having a great time about it. Um, and so this is kind of the idea of like permission to be creative. A lot of creativity, helps like help guides, um, not just software. So like Bob Ross is kind of the, the guru of giving people permission to be creative. And like, notice that he's not being like, you're gonna be great at this. That's not what he's doing. He's saying like, no, no, you're gonna be human at this and that's gonna be beautiful in its own way. So he's being a very good host in his program to say like, you're welcome here and your mistakes are welcome here too. Um, so yeah. It turns out the same things that are going on with this blank page of like, you know, freezing up and feeling judgment and feeling trained to come up with the right answer, uh, running out of ideas are the same thing that happen when you do like small talk at a party. You feel like the judgment of eyes upon you um, and you just like feel paralysis. Um, and so that's why um, often part of being a good host in a social space is giving people uh, prompts about what they're supposed to do. Um, so there's a lot of stuff uh, we can just like mine improv for this. Um, Heim Gingold, who did the Creature Creator, which we mentioned earlier, he was really into improv. Like while he was working on Spore and designing he Creature Creator, he was taking classes in at UC Berkeley in improv, like high level improv classes. Um, and then he just like stuffed all this improv knowledge into the, into the Spore Creature Creator and it was hugely successful. So like, I know that's a data point of one, but I suspect that like that was strongly correlated of like, what if we make a really good improv partner gosh, people are saying this is a really good improv partner. I think that actually worked. Um, so yeah, improv has a lot of these techniques. Um, and we can often just like mine these for both casual creators and like social casual creators. So have things like prompts and games and rituals, um, the concept of magic circle, like we're gonna be very silly in this space and nothing else can bleed out of this space. Um, the concept of masks, like, oh, it wasn't me doing this. Um, you know, I'm playing a sniper in this game. I'm not a terrible person who's gonna kill all my friends, but right now I'm wearing a a sniper mask and that's okay. Um, uh, like, um, wow, why can't my brain come up with words? Um, the, the game where like one of you is uh, like, there's four of you tiny blobs in space trying to get tasks done, but one of you, oh, Among Us. So Among Us is like, one of you is gonna put on a mask of being a terrible person um, and try to like murder all the other members of the crew. Um, and so that's kind of like putting on a mask in this space and it's okay because you're playing a game together. It's magic circle. So yeah, this is kind of like this idea of like, you know, um, you give people permission to be social by saying like, by paradoxically saying, here's what you must do. Here's kind of the ritual that we're participating in. Um, I don't know if Sweden has a like a, a tradition of greeting cards. I know it's a big thing in America. Like if somebody has a birthday, you send them a card um, or if for Christmas, you send people cards. It's kind of like- Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah, and yeah. I think the reason that we have that, um, like it's, persisted, especially among old people, is that it gives you this wonderful space of just like, there's a yes and a yes and for improv. So if I don't know my nephew, I can send him like a card that just has happy birthday and I have done a social. I have successfully done social. Um, 
Uh, but if I like know him and I know that he loves trucks and he loves Star Wars, like what if I can find one that's like Star Wars, but also a truck and I'll send him that. And that's like me kind of yes anding and like maybe I'll write a little message in. But I'm always kind of in a safe space. I always know what's expected of me. Um, I'm not going to accidentally like screw him, like screw up and send him the wrong thing. Um, and so if you have like Facebook, like, you know, that stupid thing that Facebook does where it's like, oh, it's this person's birthday, like click the button to wish them a happy birthday. Yes. Or write them a little message or send them an animated GIF, like try to curate something clever. And you know, it's like pretty hard to curate something clever in that moment, but you can always just mash that like happy birthday button. And so that's Facebook actually doing a fairly clever thing of just giving you a yes and yes and of creativity. So yeah, um, do the expected thing, elaborate a little bit or counterplay. Um, you know, I could wish you a very unhappy birthday if I'm feeling kind of puckish. Um, and so, yeah, it's like giving people permission. You can color in this book. Anything that you color in this book is fine, even if like that's not normally okay. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of games about this. Uh, the Victorians kind of invented social awkwardness and then they immediately invented a bunch of games to prevent social awkwardness, which I think is kind of a cool pairing. Um, there's a bunch uh, that I've seen written down. This is the only one that I could find illustrated, but it like, it kind of, gives you the concept of the games of like pinch without laughing. So in a in a situation where you're not allowed to normally touch people, um, young women are now allowed to pinch old men. Um, this is like such social permission, right? Like you're certainly not allowed to do that normally, but suddenly because you're playing a game, it's okay. Like this is my yes and yes and. Um, and then you have other games about permission like uh, um, uh, cards against humanity, which like, and this kind of shows you that this is a double-edged sword. Like if you make a safe space for people to play and like say like anything with like in the coloring book, you're allowed to color on the pages even though you're not normally allowed to color on the pages. Um, you need to be aware that people are going to like take that and like sometimes people will design these spaces for people to be awful in. Um, and so you have to notice like kind of when you're permitting things in your magic circle and like why you're permitting things in your magic circle um, to be kind of to give people permission to do things. Um, this is a, a concept that I, I'm coining called blame washing. Um, and this is the idea that like often when we use these uh, casual creators or social kind of games, we allow the system to take the blame. So I spin the twister dial and it tells me to hip check you. It didn't actually tell me to hip check you, but it gave me permission to. Um, and it gave me, not only did I have permission to, I also have somebody to blame if I did that. It's like, oh, well, the spinner was on red. I really had no choice. Um, oh, this was my hand in Cards Against Humanity. I had no choice but to put down this card. Um, like, I wasn't the one who wrote the card. They wrote the card. That's really their problem. Um, there's a lot of really cool stuff you can do with this. The sort of, like, absolute um, top practitioner in this, to my to my mind, is um, Dietrich Squinkifer, who does a, a number of different works with this. Um, I actually played uh, this one over on the right here at my drama day. This was our, our opening game to kind of get people comfortable with the concept of AI as part of theater. Um, and this is something that uses the tracery language that I made to give people ridiculous ways to greet each other. So this is like kind of using that same ritual thing of like, um, we're in a magical space. The computer says that we're doing something with two people who don't know each other. Um, we're given a ridiculous command that would not otherwise be permissible. Um, and then it's also kind of giving us a yes and yes and like I'm I'm told to gaze cordially into your secrets, but it's up to me to kind of like decide where your secrets are and like how to gaze cordially into them. Um, the last one that we played had with the regard of a candle maker, I think it was like tap your left cheek and it was like, is it their left cheek? Is it my left cheek? Like what does a candle maker feel? Um, and so, but like this is kind of this magical pattern that we see occur over and over again of like, um, permission to do the yes, permission to do the yes and. You can always feel safe like as a host, like as a, as a guest doing the yes. And you're also given permission to feel safe doing a yes and. So yeah, that's the other thing if you take it away. So yeah, it turns out this is like also an issue in um, social situations, um, especially in Zoom. Zoom is basically like we stripped away, like, like what is the social situation? Oh, you know, it's when two people are talking to each other well, I see we have audio and I see we have video and we have faces. So obviously the most important part of social stuff is to have audio, to have video and to have faces. Um, and so we built that and then it turns out there was less than we hoped for there. Uh, there were all these things that like, you know, are our bodies like facing towards each other? Are we facing away? Do we have little like fiddly objects that we can kind of like 
not make eye contact all the time. So a lot of like, if you look at like social rituals of things like quilting bees and board game nights and poker nights and like dumpling making nights, you often have like little fiddly stuff that you're doing with your hand where you don't have to make eye contact. But when you want, like, and like, there's like, you can talk about the thing that you're doing, um, but when you want to, you can look up and make eye contact. And Zoom was like, what if you have eye contact all the time? Um, and it's actually like, and nothing to do with your hands. Uh, and that's actually really hard. And we didn't realize that that was a load bearing affordance. Um, so yeah, we've all had this kind of experience of like, there's too many faces looking at us and we're not sure what we're supposed to do. Um, so yeah, this is basically just like, I'll, I'll maybe just end on this slide um, and I can go into other slides. So you now have all my slides after this, which are kind of going into all these patterns. But these are a bunch of things that like, um, I just got really into um, when I was finding them in online social spaces um, that like, good social spaces will do well. And there's a number of different spaces that are experimenting with this. There's things like gather.town. Um, darn, there's a super cute one that is like you all, it's like gather.town, but you're all like little animals. Um, anyway, there's a lot of these kind of spatial things that are bringing things back in, but like the clever ones are adding in and you could actually like add a bunch of these into Zoom calls as well. Um, but giving uh, one of the big ones that I came up with is chat pets. Um, or cheese plates, which is again, this kind of like fiddly thing to do with your hands while you're talking to people. Um, like every good party has a cheese plate or something to do with your hands. Um, I've seen this kind of in a number of different forms. Um, I've seen conferences that have Lego kits out front. And so if you want to socialize with people, you just go stand over by the Lego kit and start putting pieces together. And someone else will come like put pieces together and you can kind of companionably put pieces together until they're like, oh, do you have a blue piece? It's like, yeah. Oh, what talks are you going to today? Like, oh, yeah, where'd you come from? Oh, yeah. Um, or like other activities on whiteboards. Um, the conferences that fail often don't have these. Like there's just, they have, I've been to, I went to a super high-end conference that they were trying to impress us. They had an infinite budget. They had all sorts of like fancy food, fancy guests, fancy activities, um, and a complete absence of cheese plates. So I was there with all these other amazing people and we never got to talking because we weren't just given a thing to like fiddle with, with our hands. Like if like for the million dollars that they spent on that conference, like a $12 Lego kit would have actually gotten them more mileage. Uh, they also had no whiteboard. So like, there's nothing that you can look at while you're talking to another person. It's like, what if you just stare them in the eyes? Um, so yeah. Um, and like chat pets, I often say just because sometimes like interrupting people is kind of a useful thing to do. Like if there's a dog at a party, you can ignore the dog if you're having deep conversations, but if you're not having deep conversations, you can always say like, oh, look at the thing that the dog is doing. So yeah, that's kind of really, um, I wanted to leave plenty of space for questions. Um, yeah, just kind of rituals, increase permission. Um, there's a lot of these that like get adapted in modern days. Like this, like if you've seen this thing go around your Facebook feed or your Twitter feed, it's like these rituals of permission where it's like, oh, I can't tell you, this is like Twister or like pinch without laughing for the modern age. Um, I can't like just tell you like, hey, tell me if you've got a crush on me. But if I'm like, hey, I'm gonna post this funny image, lol, just tell me if pink. Um, then like that gives us kind of both permission in this space. So yeah, um, I'll just kind of leave it there uh, and ask for questions and um, just like a lot of this stuff comes out of 1950s sociology. So you can like get into the 1950s sociology, like the Victorians invented social awkwardness in the 1950s perfected it and elevated it to also loneliness. And I think we've discovered exciting new kinds of loneliness. So we're coming up with like exciting new kinds of uh, oh, here we go. There's uh, skittish is the one with the animals. Um, so yeah, any questions? I'll just kind of leave. I know I keep saying I'll leave it here, but like, like, what if I show you all of my other slides, which is like me not being a good host. I want to give you permission. I now give you permission to ask questions um, or even just to like take some time and applaud and digest the talk. But I also say like, yes, and you can like now interact with us in any way. Oh, Kate, thank you so much for this talk. Really wonderful. A big applaud uh, from us. Now we're all sitting on Zoom, so we have to use like emojis um, and, and, and stuff like that. Yeah, and I think like the Zoom emojis, are, like the Zoom emojis are actually pretty good because they do give you a yes. Like, they're, they're, like, here's the ritual. We're all going to like applaud where like somebody could yes and and do like smiley face or whatever. Um, yeah. If, if you have uh, questions, uh, you can type them in, in the chat and I can read them 
um, I can read them uh, to Kate. Yeah, I've, I've actually got it minimized now, so I can. Yes. Uh, I can yes. see the questions. Uh, I was uh, while you were. You mentioned that um, we had Mike Cook here as well, and he was also talking about the notion of uh, the crafting aspects, uh, which kind of resonated. He was talking about it, like especially PCG work mm -hmm. um, as a type of um, gardening or rewilding. And yeah. kind of like he didn't say the word as you do, the uh, autotelic um, uh, creativity. But it feels like there is kind of like similar um, streams. Yeah, and his his talk also had a lot of kind of this interplay between control and chaos. <coughs> but I, you don't I was, want like a totally controlled garden, and you don't want a totally chaotic garden. So you can either start with a chaotic wilderness and start like sort of using that chaos to weave patterns into to sort of braid the chaos into a garden, um, or you can like start with the totally fixed garden and provide these kind of like um coloring book spaces where the roses can tangle um and nature can nature can kind of express its tangled wilderness in in given spaces there's also i was thinking also about the um the social aspects you're talking about and the emily post social etiquette uh thing of how to be a good host and uh because then we have so much more complexity bringing in all the social situations. And, and this is really relevant as well to, I mean, all sorts of experience design and, and game design, mm -hmm. like having the AI being like a polite host, as you put it. Like what to, uh, one question is like, what type of um, applications can you see for polite AI hosts? Yeah, really anything like, you know, even if you're doing a World of Warcraft, like or a fighting game, like what is the AI doing to make you feel welcome and safe in this space? Or like if you have a word processor, what is the word processor doing to make you feel polite and welcome? Um, so it's it's often just like little things like um, Google Docs now does this quite nice thing where um, it says, you know, we often don't think of Google Docs as a social network, but if you have multiple people, um, mm -hmm. it is now a social network. And so it does this thing where it's like, if we're editing a document together, it'll um, it'll show me who else is present in the space, um, and it'll give them distinct identities. So, and it'll give it, it'll assign us a kind of surprising identity. So, right now in the the sheets, I can see that we have a uh, chipmunk here. Um, right. Yeah. So, and it's kind of fun to see who you are or tr to try to figure out who you are. Um, so yeah, it's just these kind of like little moments of surprise and delight, um, where you have you have surprise, but then you also have like kind of I don't know, it's just giving people social affordances. So like if you if you have a doc, so I've been working on a, um, a networked online uh, document editor just uh, for fun um, or to use in my classes really. But if you uh, have people, so it's like, okay, what do I need for this? Um, if I type stuff, it appears in other people's stuff. Um, it's extremely terrifying to have like typing appear in your document um, mm -hmm. and to have no sign of where that came from even though you know like it's connected to another person. But as soon as you put like a little peg there and like you have the sense of the body in space, um, even if the body is just like, this is a cursor on this line, um, I can see like where you are, where your attention is. It's all these like affordances um, that then allow you to be polite. And like, it brings in politeness. So if you can't tell them my cursor is, we might start typing in the same thing. And it's like, if we were both invisible at a party, we might bump into each other and that would be a big social awkwardness thing. But if we have the physical presence of our bodies as cursors, people actually start to maintain um, personal space in a Google document. You, you will very rarely see two people put their cursors on the same place. Wow, you're right. I did notice, yeah, I've noticed that too. But so yes, yeah, so like it really on anything, hmm. like giving people a sense of the presence of their body will bring in all of these other affordances that we didn't notice we had. So like the, um, this is something we see a lot in online conferences, um, especially if you, uh, online poster sessions I've seen done in like, like five different ways with varying success. Um, and people were like, oh, the, the important thing about online poster sessions is you have the presenter can talk and you have the poster. Um, and so they would like have like Zoom rooms or stuff. And it turns out actually the thing that you really want in poster sessions is the idea of being able to scan the room and see where people are clustering. 
Um, and so I've seen uh, things like gather.town much more successful because again, we can see, you know, are people all smushed together in front of one thing? Are they facing the thing? Um, are they talking? Are they all silent as the presenter is talking? Um, you know, are people kind of drifting back and forth? Like, are there like, wh where are the clusters? And it turns out we're really good at reading like body positioning, even when we don't have bodies, even when our, our body is a cursor. I was thinking, you, you told me that you had this workshop um, at the theater department. Yeah. And, and to my mind, like theater people, they are, I mean, having been used to doing improv and all that, they're probably much more um, like aware of how they use uh, the body and proximity mm -hmm. and gestures and all these kind of social stuff than we as uh, engineers might be. How, how was it? Like, did you, at the workshop, did you? Yeah, it was, it was super effective. We talked a lot about um, what kind of partner different kinds of AIs are. Um, so we had some tracery, which is kind of your, your chaotic partner who's just throwing out ideas and can't really take in your ideas effectively, but you can still use that as kind of the, like the interesting idea generator hmm. um, and is very controllable in what you put in it. So you have like kind of total control over what you're putting into this partner. Um, and then you have things like a uh, GPT-2, which is like a very willful partner that you haven't trained and they're going to kind of get onto weird, they've got like more common sense about how things are constructed um, and they're able to kind of like spin out interesting stories but it's often very they're very willful it's very hard to control them um even if you're like and then we go to the apothecary and they're like then we go to the strip club and then we go to the apothecary like you have to kind of like mash it into them a couple of times before they'll they'll take that turn um so yeah uh we did a lot of that but then we also um make key makeys if you're familiar with those um it's a little toy that um it's basically like the if you want to do kind of Arduino like touch um, electronic stuff, um, it's the very easy version of that because it thinks it's a keyboard. So you plug it into your computer, um, and if you connect two of the terminals, it types the A key, um, it, or two other terminals, it types the B key. So, and then you can like um, make very simple circuits around that. Um, and so we were able to do things like okay, one of you touch one circuit, one of you touch the other circuit, um, and then if you hold hands or shake hands. Um, one of the groups did an introduction thing. So when you shake hands, it makes tracery speak some words aloud. Um, so it spoke kind of ridiculous words of introduction when two people shook hands. So this kind of idea of like, yeah, the human gesture is part of that. So they could just say like, okay, we're gonna touch fingers um, or like anytime I slap you on your wrist, it's gonna make an introduction. But like, they're like, no, like part of this ritual is we're gonna shake hands and that's gonna be what closes the circuit. So uh, one question for you, uh, like, like now in a completely different way, is that if uh, someone wants to read about like uh, casual creators, definitional stuff to write about mm -hmm. it, um, except for your thesis, uh, is there uh, like something short available that yeah. you can recommend? Um, let me just quickly link to the, uh, the zine bundle. Oh, yes. Because that's got all of my... There you go. Oh. There we are. No. Oh. I'll show you how to get to it from my site. So it's galaxykey.com and then uh, yeah. zines and resources, all zines. No. Oh. What? my site down or something? Okay. Oh, there we are. Here we go. There's an itch.io thing in the, in the corner and then there's all my zines there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that'll get you all the zines. Um, Casual Creators is kind of the like nice one to, to read. Um, here's, oops, I made an open source art tool which is like how to run a repo as a good host. <coughs> um, but yeah, that would be the thing that I would recommend reading. Um, there's also an academic article um, if you need something to cite and don't want to cite zines, although I'd encourage you to cite zines, like be bold. Um, uh, but there is a peer reviewed article in ICCC um, from like 2016 or something that is kind of defining casual creators for the first time. That is really good. Uh, I might some be bold and 
uh, use uh, zine formats in, in course literature. But I think uh, if that is done, it needs to be backed up with articles. Yeah. Um, another, th this whole thing with social affordances and um, most people who are in our situation and our students will be and are in situations where they need to be creative together with other people, like hosting mm -hmm. workshops, being in workshops. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that I was thinking that there's a lot to learn, not just about building systems, but um, how to act together in groups when you are building the systems mm -hmm. uh, as a kind of process, um, as a process. Uh, oh, uh, another question I wanted to ask you. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about the, the, um, the roguelike celebra celebration? You mentioned it uh, earlier in the talk. Yeah, the roguelike celebration is, um, it's a, here we go. Um, it's a, an annual festival that's like really interesting. So it started off as a celebration of roguelike games. Um, which are these sort of like 1980s genre of games where you're like on a grid and you're like an ASCII character that is moving along the grid and exploring a procedural dungeon. Um, and uh, people have been making those continuously since then. So it's one of the few uh, games conferences where you can go and talk to somebody who's been working on the same game for 30 years, um, which is kind of an interesting like ex experience of expertise. Um, and then they started welcoming in people who are doing like indie procedural content generation um, and academics who were doing procedural content generation it ended up being like the like festival of rogue like celebrating roguelikes and also indie PCG and so there's a lot of like it's my favorite kind of PCG conference to go to anyway they do a really spectacular um uh they did a spec hopefully they'll do it again um where they did the roguelike um M walker let's see if we got it. M walker's uh Anyway, they built an online roguelike that was active during the conference that you could wander around in. Oh, here we go. Um, so yeah, there was actually a little space and you could see that like different people, like it says how many people are in each space. So you're not actually like spatially wandering around, but it, it had the certain sort of thing of like, oh, I can see that actually like 136 people are currently in the unconference lobby. I should probably wander over there. Um, or like actually, oh, three people are in the East Showcase Hall. So if I want to talk to like a small group of people about a thing, I can go over to the Showcase Hall, look at kind of some of the stuff that's on display and like be chatting people up about that. But it was also just like chock full of these cheese place and chat pets. It was like little um, commands that you could type. Uh, so you could go to the virtual bar and order a virtual drink and it would generate a little like kind of tracery style drink. Um, and so then you would say like, oh, what did you got? What did you get? I got a blank. Um, and kind of one of the things I didn't mention was um, the idea of secrets and shibboleths is part of this, where it's like um, certain activities that you would do would change the color of your text or give you an emoji in your name. Um, and so you would see somebody with like a pink name or with like a rose emoji and you're like, oh my gosh, how did you get that? And they would like, they would say, oh, it, it, it's kind of fun to put sometimes people in a position of power or expertise where mm. then they would say like, oh, I guess, you know, I've only been here for 15 minutes, but suddenly I'm the expert. Let me show you to the magical portal that you wander through and it ch makes you change color. And then we'll have kind of taken that journey together and um, had had a few moments together. Uh, so the, the idea of like, how big is your space? You know, how is it big enough to have a couple of secrets? Is it big enough for people to wander off by themselves? Um, but can you also do this kind of line of sight thing where if you have a huge space full of uh, mazes, you can't actually see where anybody is and you just feel like you're wandering alone. Um, but if I can see that like, okay, I'm over here and there's a big party over there. I need somebody to help me walk over to the big party. That's kind of like the ideal social situation. We have like line of sight and explorability and secrets and um, kind of body position and all it's just like once you have more of these affordances each affordance will interact with other affordances and then you can like they'll start to build up these really interesting patterns it's so elegant um, too like but the more oh, but oh, the oh, more oh. ones that you pull away the more you end up with just kind yeah. of an empty room you're like well nobody's using the cheese plate oh well it's because no one can see that anyone is standing by the cheese plate so if you have a cheese plate with no proximity view 
uh, then nobody uses the cheese plate for its intended, like intended activity. But yeah, so it's, it's, sociology yeah. is just a big machine. Um, and there's all these moving parts and we didn't notice how they were all interacting with each other <laughs> until we pulled out one and all the other ones stopped working. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and here we are. I love that system. It's so elegant um, in, in, in all its simplicity. Well, it not, it's not simple. The simplicity mm -hmm. is just graphical representation. Oh yeah, here's, here's a, yeah. if you can see the, the screen, yeah. There's, yeah. there's everybody getting different things and you can see that like some of them got like interesting, interesting things happening. Yeah, party activities. Yes, more, more of that. Yeah. Okay, it's five o'clock uh and uh and for you uh it's starting to <laughs> like a more decent morning eight o'clock yeah time for breakfast <laughs> yeah time for breakfast here i think we're gonna go towards dinner um and uh thank you so much kate for coming and talk to us all the way from california to uh to stockholm um it's been amazing another applaud thank you so yeah, much. thank you so much for providing the space for this and i hope to see you soon uh, yeah in real life We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.